Good evening, everybody, and thank you for that very warm welcome. Uh, we do have a very special guest tonight on this Fifth Estate, the member for Lily in Queensland, the Federal Treasurer from 2007 to 2013 and Deputy Prime Minister from 2010 till 2013, the Euro Money Finance Minister of the Year, 2011, and <laughs> and the author of The Good Fight, Six Years, Two Prime Ministers, and Staring Down the Great Recession. Welcome, Wayne Swan. We'll give him one more clap, just you're so friendly. Thanks, Sally. It's great to be here. Um, and uh, my name is Sally Warhaft. I thought to get us in the mood, Wayne, I brought along... That sounds ominous. ...my <laughs> Lehman's brother mug, ah. which was given to me um, in 2009 by my dear husband to remind me that there were always people having a worse day than I was. <laughs> <laughs> so cheers to them. Uh, and... Of course, uh, look, that is where I want to start, is with the global financial crisis, because it was the defining, uh, well, policy event of your time as Treasurer. And I thought we'd start with a a briefing that you had with a bloke called Tim Stewart, a former Mm -hmm. Treasury official and manager from the Fortress Group, while you were visiting Washington in April 2008. And... You were talking about the Bear Stearns Mm. collapse and he said to you, Bear Stearns is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. It is just the end of the beginning. And your reply, which you whispered to Ken Henry, was, I think we're going to have to rethink the budget. That's right. (laughs) So take us back to that time and, and tell us more about your thinking in that moment. Well... Through the first part of 2008, the whole public debate was about dealing with inflationary pressures in the economy. There'd been 10 interest rate rises in a row uh, under Treasurer Costello and the Liberals and and one or two more under us. So inflation was hitting a 16-year high. So all of the public discussion at that time was, well, how do we deal with these inflationary pressures? They're putting interest rates through the roof. Uh, really hurting uh, families with mortgages. What do we do about that? But behind the scenes, uh, from January that year, both Kevin and I began preparing for the worst and hoping for the best, because we were beginning to get signals that all wasn't right in the global economy. And I opened the book with a discussion with Hank Paulson that I had in January uh, of that year when I was at the Sunshine Coast about uh, the American recession, which was uh, unfolding. And as we went through uh, those months, we then had uh, the collapse of Bear Stearns, which was just prior to the IMF World Bank meetings in Washington in April. Now, Bear Stearns was the fifth biggest investment bank in the United States. So this was a very, very big deal, and uh, and it fell over. The previous year, towards the end of the year in London, we'd seen a run on Northern Rock the first modern bank run that uh, we had seen uh, in, uh, in, in that country. So there was a lot of volatility around. So Be- when Bear Stearns fell over, there was a very decisive intervention from the US authorities and things had begun to stabilise. So that takes us through to this lunch in Washington because I'd been there for my first IMF meeting, which was pretty awesome, you know. You, <laughs> People from my era were growing up, uh, grew up thinking the IMF was full of all these uh, mad right wingers who were coming to oppress the rest of the world. So, <laughs> when when I was sitting in that meeting and they banged the gavel, I said, "Gee, I'm a governor of the IMF. You know, what would have all my uni mates thought about that?" <laughs> So I'd been through the IMF meetings that day, and whilst people were okay, I thought their body language was displaying a bit of concern. So I wandered off uh, to talk to um, uh, to Tim Stewart, uh, who was uh, very senior and one of the major hedge hedge funds in in New York, and that's when he made that that uh, that comment. He said, "It's not the end. It's not the beginning of the end. It's just the end of the beginning." And, you know, that's a big deal if someone just has witnessed the uh, destruction of the fifth biggest investment bank in the United States saying that's just, you know, the end of the beginning. There's a lot more to come. So 
We went home, uh, we recalibrated our budget, we didn't cut as hard as we would have cut uh, if we were going to be uh, really decisive in, in showing that uh, public saving was going to make a contribution to lessening inflationary pressures in the economy. And of course, when the budget came down, I was absolutely bagged by every commentator in the country for not cutting hard enough. Uh, but as it turned out, a wise decision, because as things unfolded in the second half of the year, uh, then if we would have been contracting our budget in the way in which people had urged us to do, then we would have been in bigger strife than we were. But at that time, uh, there were just countervailing forces. And still, right through to the end of June, uh, the whole debate in the global economy was petrol prices are too high, commodity prices are too high, inflationary pressures are too high. It just turned very savagely uh, through uh, late July, early August, then through September. And of course... Yesterday, the 15th of September, is the sixth anniversary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Oh, well, happy anniversary. <laughs> I'm trying to imagine how you felt. If we go back to um, when you were handed the Red Book, so you win government, you're the new <coughs> treasurer, uh, the Treasury Department hand you a, a Red Book... Uh, you have obviously been shadow <coughs> treasurer and in that time, I'm sure, have been crafting and thinking about what your first budget would be. And, of course, it all so suddenly uh, just falls away. One of the really interesting things, of course, it, about how suddenly it is, is that there was nothing in that red book no. forecasting what was to happen. Tell us the process of, of the realisation for you that this was really, really severe? I guess um, it started around the end of July and, er and early August uh, when we started to see a lot more volatility uh, in financial markets. And in reality, the penny really dropped uh, a week before uh, the Lehman Brothers collapsed. I think it was the 7th of September. On the 7th of September, uh, Fanny... Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, the two very big American mortgage houses, which were responsible for 50% of all of the mortgages in the United States, fell over. So that was the week before Lehman Brothers. And that's when we knew that we were in uncharted waters. Uh, it was very unclear how this was going to unfold. So when Lehman Brothers went over, and the reason it was so catastrophic was that everyone had expected that when Lehman Brothers got into trouble that the authorities would have done what they did with Bear Stearns, which is to move in, uh, secure its future, line it up with a partner. And uh, they decided not to do this uh, with Lehman Brothers. So essentially, from the day that Lehman Brothers collapsed, the global economy literally fell off a cliff. And financial markets went into meltdown. And of course, you know, financial markets are really you know, the, the blood supply uh, for the global economy, and that was starting to seize up. So by the time I got to, uh, to Washington for my next set of IMF World Bank meetings, the US economy was not only in recession but heading into deep recession. The developed world was all rapidly heading for recession, and the developing world was getting very worried about heading uh, for recession. And one of the, a couple of the meetings that will stand out in my mind that reinforced to me that, um, that you know, anything could happen, what we were really facing there, and this was haunting me, and I talk about this in the book, was that we were then facing Great Depression Mark II. That's actually what we were facing. So when we flew there for the uh, World Bank meetings, I went to New York first, got, got up the next morning, first port of call, off to the stock exchange. I leave and they have the biggest fall, that, or second biggest fall that they'd had since the Great Depression. I go to a series of meetings on Wall Street. and One really stands out in my mind, uh, once again with a very large hedge fund manager. And he's sitting there and he says, said to me, I oh, look, this morning, I just had a phone call from an old college roommate. And what he said to me was, could I help him make all the arrangements immediately for him to move to Brazil and live in a cave. <laughs> and then he just stopped. And he looked at me and he said, shit, what if he's right? <laughs> you know, what if it is that bad? He then looked out the window and said, out there, you know, there's over a thousand hedge funds. 
in a few weeks' time, most of those will be gone. We then went on to uh, meetings with another large American bank, Bank of America, where no one was at home. The guys were sitting around the table, but there were just blank stares. So I knew by that stage, you know, we were facing something uh, really, really bad. And Kevin and I had been lobbying uh, the US government and other G20 members to get an emergency meeting of G20 finance ministers going uh, for the IMF uh, meetings that were happening uh, that weekend. And the White House agreed to that towards the end of that week as I headed up to Washington, which takes us through to what is now the incarnation of the modern G20, which started uh, that weekend in Washington after the IMF meetings, where President George Bush came along. And it wasn't expected that he was coming. We thought we were having an emergency meeting of finance ministers. And at the last minute, George Bush walks through the door and he sits down and he's sitting at the main table and the chair of the G20 then uh, was the Brazilian finance minister whose English wasn't great. And he was apologising to the other G20 finance ministers sitting around the room for his poor English. And George Bush leaned over and said, that's OK, I don't speak English very well either. The only problem was all the mics were on. <laughs> so all the G20 finance ministers were listening to the US president <laughs> give them reassurance uh, about the future of the global economy. But what really impressed me, and I was quite surprised by this, because like probably many Australians, I didn't particularly have a high opinion of uh, uh, George Bush. Uh, he, he then went on to, to apologise uh, to the finance ministers there for the fact that events in the US economy, particularly the subprime crisis, had led to this point that all of their economies were threatened. And I thought it was an incredibly humble, genuine uh, statement that he made to the finance ministers and personally gave me a lot of faith that at least uh, if, if George Bush understood just how serious this was, that he'd come to this emergency meeting, that he'd been prepared to apologise to people, at least we finally had the authorities in the United States on side for a very, very substantial response. And of course that then led to uh, the Washington summit that occurred uh, uh, a couple of months later, which he presided over. You point out in the book that you never met many of those finance ministers again because their governments just started falling like flies and they, they lost their jobs. There yeah. are very few of you that, that remained. Early on in this, uh, I think it might have been the summer, in fact, before the, the crisis hit, you were reading the biography of Red Ted Theodore, who was the Queensland... He was a Queenslander and treasurer in the Scullin government, yeah. which, of course, um, came to grief during the Great Depression. Tell us how often you thought about Red Ted Theodore and the Scullin oh. government and what you learned from it. Well, all of the time. Um, I was very haunted by, you know, perhaps the spectre of what had occurred during the Great Depression. And of course, uh, my, uh, my parents were of that era. My uh, grandfather was a soldier war settler uh, at Amines in, in Stanthorpe. Uh, his sons were forced off the farm during the Great Depression. Uh, and there were seven of those. Um, uh, I was very familiar with, as many people in this room would be, with what had occurred to that generation, that the economy had been a basket case basically from the 1930s with 30% you know, unemployment, that the Australian economy only recovered after World War II, a whole generation of people scarred uh, by mass uh, unemployment uh, and the community destruction that comes with it. And I was very aware also, which is, I guess, for some reason I decided I'd take Ross Fitzgerald's book, Up to the Coast, along with another one called Black Swan, which is about improbable events that only occur every 1,000 years. Um, and that was my, my Christmas reading, and I was, I was going through it. But essentially what happened, the Scullin government uh, was, uh, if you like, derailed completely by the events of the Great Depression and internal disunity. But essentially, as the Great Depression hit, uh, the, uh, they... Uh, adopted in the end austerian type policies which made the Great Depression deeper and that occurred in Australia as it did in the United States and in Great Britain and Theodore was an early Keynesian uh, and he was uh, the, the first treasurer in that government and was at that stage contemplating Keynesian type responses but became victim to a political witch hunt in his home state over an investment in a mine uh, 
uh, and had to appear before a Royal Commission and was in fact sidelined during all of these debates about the economic orientation of a Labor government. So I was acutely aware of the circumstances of that government, how it had been pulled apart by a whole series of political forces, that the failure of the Scullin government to put in place an early Keynesian response had left our country small and isolated, exposed to the full uh, blast, if you like, uh, of the Great Depression. And I was absolutely determined that on my watch, I wasn't going to sit still. I wasn't going to become, the, or the government wasn't going to become the victim uh, of a whole set of proposals, which I think, you know, uh, were still very prevalent and remain so to this day, which is one of the reasons I've written the book. Because there's a lot of people who want to demonise what we did during the global financial crisis because they still have the view that austerian type policies are the ones that should have prevailed back in, in, in uh, this episode, as they did in the Great Depression. And of course, if that view wins, then the next time we have an economic emergency in Australia, and, it, and we will, if that view wins, you'll see mass unemployment and community destruction like we saw in the Great Depression, but didn't see, didn't see in this episode here. So the response or the mantra was, uh, go early, go hard. You went very hard, go households. Tell us about how how that was formulated and especially, I mean, the, the, the biggest criticism has been you spent too much. Sure. How did you formulate that plan and, and do you think you spent too much? No, I don't think we spent too much and I'll explain why. Because we had two phases of fiscal stimulus and a very extensive phase of monetary policy stimulus. Uh, the monetary policy stimulus, unfortunately, is something that only really takes, uh, it takes eight to nine months at a minimum to work. We're seeing this in our economy now. Interest rates have been low for a long time, but it's taken a while to get the property market going. So monetary policy is not an medium, it's, it's not an immediate and perhaps in some certain circumstances not even a medium term response, although it's an essential one to work with fiscal policy. But when you have an immediate crisis, there is only one thing that a government can do to, to stimulate demand. And in the first instance, if you want to stimulate demand immediately, the only thing you can do is to get people to spend money. So a lot of people, critics say, well, with that first stimulus, why didn't you put it into a long-term infrastructure project? Well, because it was long-term. What actually had to happen in the short term was to get people spending money because essentially the panic was such that on the Friday before we announced our bank guarantees, and our first stimulus package, the, the, uh, the bank guarantees were announced on the Sunday and the stimulus package was the Monday, Tuesday. On the Friday before that, those decisions were taken by the government, we effectively had a run on the banks in Australia. Armour Guard ran out of money. So when that uh, mentality takes over, when people panic that their savings are not safe, when people see carnage in international markets, they stop spending. And of course, when everyone stops spending it at once, it's the collective impact of that on the economy which is greater than the sum of its parts. And that works in reverse. If you get your stimulus right and you get the confidence effects right, that impact is greater than the sum of its parts. So the first stage was to have an immediate impact on consumption, which was, assembly to, which was essentially to target payments to those people with the highest propensity to spend. That is people on low to medium incomes. And that's effectively what our first payments did. And, the, and one of the most pleasurable days I had was the day that the head of Woolworths rang me to tell me about the real impact in his stores of what was going on with our consumption payments before Christmas. That was people were buying roasts and undies. <laughs> and that was the sort of consumption you needed immediately. Because we were really worried that everything was going so badly I mean, all these fantastic figures were floating around. You know, you, Europe's contracted by 5%. You know, all these countries. This was the constant diet of news. Uh, we had to put a floor under confidence for Christmas because if we didn't do that, we not only feared what that would mean immediately for employment, what we really feared was what it would mean for real estate prices, both commercial and residential, and all the rest of it. So stage one, immediate boost. Immediate boost to consumption. So we got through Christmas. Uh, without what happened in, in just about every other developed economy, which was a very, very bad Christmas. But the second stage was then to get a pipeline of activity which would last uh, more than six months and go on for some years. Because if people were going to keep people in jobs, if employers were going to say to you know the apprentice, 
I can see my way clear to keep you on for another couple of years. They needed to know there was going to be a pipeline of work. So we did some more consumption payments in February, but we also did the medium-term infrastructure spending so that people knew that they kept their, their, their employees on, there was a pipeline of work coming. And that was the economic theory behind the school halls. They could be done almost immediately. They could be done very quickly. We owned the land, the plans were there in many cases and so on. But what governed the size of it uh, was a meeting I had in New York at the end of uh, January 2009 because I've become privately very concerned that our banks were perhaps going to be downgraded by one of our rating agencies. Even though they were in good nick, they hadn't engaged in subprime lending, it was just that essentially uh, the rating agencies were, were scattering around and getting panicked. So one of the guys of going to G'day New York, which is a regular uh, Australian presentation in the United States that occurs every year, I flew there secretly, if you like, uh, to see the rating agencies. Uh, and to talk to them about how unfair it would, have, would be if in those circumstances they had downgraded our banks, because that would have worked against everything we were doing about confidence through our stimulus and so on. And at the same time, I took the opportunity to see other policymakers, so I went to the Federal Reserve in New York, which had borne the brunt of all of the uh, collapse in the financial system in the United States, and of course Tim Geithner, who was later to become the Treasury Secretary, uh, was part and parcel of that show. And I, I uh, uh, replicate in the book the memo of the meeting, which was really downbeat. Uh, all the officials in the Federal Reserve were talking about Great Depression Mark II. And they were saying to us, you know, you've done a great job, you're ahead of the rest of the world in the response so far, but everything we're seeing in the global economy is bad. And bear in mind, China at this stage was in deep trouble. This notion that was around that Australia was saved by China is nonsense. I mean, China was in much strife as any other country at this stage. And I'd been there in December the previous year and, and, and saw, you know, the, the lines of people who were, who, were, who were going back to the villages. So the end point is in the memo. So I said to these people there, I said, well, we've done this much. What do you reckon the sort of policy response ought to be now? And they just said, use overwhelming force <laughs> and that was the recommend and that's what we did uh, but in terms of if you want to use the economic jargon the second stimulus was about two percent of GDP per year that's not that big uh, people talk the numbers it was a 42 billion dollar package but it wasn't a 42 billion dollar package in one year how because much, it was spread over a number of years how much of that figure and how much of the policy formation at that time was instinct Oh, a fair bit of it was instinct. You see, when... Well, first of all, it was based on the analysis of what had gone wrong in the 90s recession in Australia, which is why the Treasury was so strong on go early, go hard, go households. They were very much scarred by the fact that in the 19, early 1990s recession that their response of the then government, the Keating government, had come too late. It wasn't quick enough, it wasn't swift enough. So that was part of the formulation, along with all the other factors that I spoke about before. Uh, but 2% um, wasn't a lot, it's 2% a year because it was spread over a number of years. But what was really important was to get the pipeline going into the next few years to give people the confidence. So we, unemployment in Australia, as a consequence of that, and this has nothing to do with China, peaked at 5.7. Peaked at 5.7 in Australia when it was in double digits for some time and a very long time around the rest of the world. Where China helped for us came in, in, in 2010, 2011, 2012, when the aftershocks of the global crisis then started to thunder through the global economy. People now forget in retrospect what was going on from about the middle of 2010. We had the Greek sovereign debt crisis, which got really bad through the end of 2010. Then we had uh, the crisis in Greece morph into the European sovereign debt crisis, which then morphed into the European banking crisis. And on top of that, then coming through in 2011, 2012, was, this, was the uh, debt cap crisis in the United States. So there these waves of instability still going on after the worst of the GFC had been dealt with, uh, but they were still hitting, in this country as well, asset prices. Share prices were down. Super returns were down. Property, property prices were down for a long time. So that pipeline of that second stimulus package put a floor under our economy, not just for 2010, but 2011 and part of 2012 as well. And I think it was needed. 
You talk about the 3rd of June 2009. I'm sure no one here really remembers what they were doing on that day unless it was your birthday. Um, but you remember it, don't you, Wayne? Well, that was, the, that was the day we got the national accounts figures which showed that, uh, that we hadn't uh, uh, experienced a recession. A recession is two quarters of negative growth. So we had recorded negative growth in the March quarter. Well, the way you write about it in the book is actually a bit like watching a football game and it's down to the last 30 seconds. You're all sitting around as if... You and know, the Broncos won. And, <laughs> and the Tigers won. And, uh, uh. and you, you know, uh. I mean, it, I was going to say like your life depended on it. Your it life did. didn't. But, but, uh. but people's livelihoods depended on it. Well, it did because it comes back to this point I was making earlier about... Um, uh, the stimulus package has been greater than the sum of uh, their parts. Uh, avoiding recession was worth billions and billions of dollars because it said, you know, that, that, that it had all worked. Now, we could have miss, missed by that much and, it, 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 and the stimulus technically would have worked, but in confidence terms, it would have been dreadful. So, you know, it, it was a, we had a lot riding on it. We didn't sit round when we were formulating our response and, and say things like, now, if we do this, what will be the political impact? I mean, we, we thought, really, at this stage, the way things were going globally, we were fighting for the future of the country. And I hesitate to, you know, to use the word war, but it, it, it was. We thought we were fighting the, the likes of, a, of an economic war, that we had an enormous threat. So we knew that when we took these big decisions that we would be kicked from one end of the country to the other for years. Um, you know, if you have 20,000 construction projects, then you're going to have enough things happening in enough projects for sensationalist coverage in tabloid newspapers to give you a headache. We knew that, um, uh, that we would be accused of recklessly spending and all the rest of it, and despite all of the reviews about the, how all those programs went, that, that, that happened, and it scarred us politically. Uh, but if it's a choice between a bad political outcome and a good economic outcome, I'll take the economic outcome any day. Do you ever fantasise about what it would have been like to have had all those billions of dollars in your pocket instead of having to give it away under those sorts of circumstances? Well, not at all. I mean, in fact, if we hadn't done that, you'd find that our deficits and debts were far higher. No, if there hadn't been a global financial... Oh, sure. If you'd been a treasurer under the kind of economy Peter Costello enjoyed. Sure. I, I, I fantasise about that every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> He only had revenue upgrades over his period in office of three hundred billion, <laughs> but but a lot of those comparisons are false. Put the politics to one side. I'd, I'd love to make that political point even more, but I'd, I'd make a more serious economic point. The, um, the 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 reason that we have a AAA credit rating now, the reason that our unemployment during the crisis peaked at five point seven. Arguably, the reason why it is still only, you know, in, in, in sixes, it's higher than it should be in some, some ways, brings enormous economic benefits to the country. We've got, we are living with a dividend that has come from that. Because if you actually get recession, then you get uh, far less tax revenue, you get more people on benefits, you get more community destruction. So there is an enormous dividend that is reaped, but it doesn't appear in the balance sheets that way. Uh, but um, one of the reasons why, you know, we come out in the OECD measures of quality of life, number one, is because we didn't experience the sort of recession that almost every other developed economy experienced in the last six years. See, here we call it the GFC because it didn't happen here. Everywhere else in the world they call it the Great Recession. Here we call it the GFC, which is sort of what it was here, but everywhere else was actually a great recession. So we've just talked about that good day in your life where you avoided the recession. You then describe one of the worst as having to come out and um, admit that the promised surplus, the returning the budget to surplus wasn't going to happen. And you say this was one of, one of the worst moments. I was always incredibly perplexed as to why you made that promise, why you stuck to it for so long, and it just seemed so unnecessary. Uh, it wasn't unnecessary. It was uh, absolutely necessary. Uh, now, I, I could say that I regret it, and in some ways I do, but I don't economically. Let's just go through it. 
Uh, we said in our 2010 budget uh, that if you're going to be Keynesian on the way down, that is, you're going to spend when there's an absence of demand, uh, if the economy starts growing again and demand picks up, then, in fact, you shouldn't be spending like you were when, uh, when it was really needed. So we set ourselves the task of coming back to surplus in 2012-13. Entirely reasonable thing to do, but most importantly, to uh, put some discipline into the show. There's a big debate at the moment about what's wrong with the budget. What's wrong with the budget is it's a revenue problem, it's not a spending problem. Spending under us is about the same average as it was under the Costello years, or even a little less. Uh, we had one year where we spent up, but uh, and that was through the stimulus, uh, but we really pulled the budget back into good spending shape I know that will jar with some people who will say, that's not what the papers say. Well, it's the fact which the government is now edging itself towards finally admitting. Uh, what occurred uh, during that period was that we had a lot of discipline. Ministers had to exist, uh, had to provide for within uh, pretty strict spending limits and, and that's what the surplus pledge held in. But what occurred towards the end uh, was unforeseen uh, and it is still a huge problem for the current government that we experienced for the first time in 50 years a situation where nominal GDP growth is below real GDP growth. I won't go back and try and interpret that into layman's terms, except to say uh, that the combination of a high dollar remaining high while commodity prices came off put an enormous squeeze on our economy, the profitability of businesses in particular, uh, miners all the way through the whole economy, which led to a series of revenue write-downs which were completely and utterly unexpected. So when I walked into the press conference to say that we wouldn't make uh, that, uh, that target of surplus that year, I simply said, what Keynes said, well, things change, so do I. What do you do? Now, it's argued that we were too emphatic uh, in saying that we would uh, uh, come back to surplus then, but. Modern politics doesn't leave a lot of room for nuance. It was the right policy as long as the revenue forecasts were correct. The revenue forecasts weren't. That's nobody's fault other than what was going on with the economy. And if you're running the show, you put your hand up and accept political responsibility for that, which I did. Did I enjoy it? No. But if it was a choice between saying I was going to cut harder when that would have been deeply irresponsible and would have cut cost jobs and wouldn't have been the right thing to do economically, once again, I was prepared to accept the political consequences of that, and they were substantial. Uh, we have to talk about the other war. We have to talk about Kevin. <coughs> the global financial crisis always seemed to me, and I feel like this is starting to come out a bit more now in your book. Paul Kelly also talks about this in his recent book. It always seemed that... Um, the, the shock of the global financial crisis required, as you put it, a war setting and you had a little mini war cabinet, the Gang of Four or, or, or whatever you, 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 you want to call them, and that your book suggests to me that that worked quite effectively during the global financial crisis. Relations were good, decision-making was sharp, communication was good. And it... It always seemed to me that once the global financial crisis was sort of under control, that the government, that Kevin Rudd, was never able to then make the transition into kind of normal governing with a caucus, with cabinet, c communications and so on. Is that a, is that a fair part of the, of the reading of yeah, it? Yeah, look, but it's much more layered than that. Um, it's got a, a it's got a policy agenda element, and the policy agenda element is that our agenda was too crowded. Uh, we talked before about the big agenda we had coming to government in 2007, and it was a big one, and it was a needed one, uh, a big agenda for uh, building infrastructure, and in particular the NBN, uh, doing something about super fast broadband, uh, a very big agenda in education, a very big agenda in climate change. And then, of course, uh, Kevin's announcement uh, after, the, um, uh, after the 2020 summit of a, of a tax inquiry and a report landing on our desk at the end of 2009. And I make the point in the book that one of our senior public servants said to me, and I, I readily agreed, that any government can deal with one really big issue at a term, or perhaps two, 
They certainly can't deal with three. And we, at this stage, in addition to dealing with a global financial crisis, where we didn't miss a beat in trying to put together our response on carbon pricing, yeah, the, the, um, uh, the carbon pollution reduction scheme, uh, our reforms in tertiary education, getting the NBN off the ground. All this was going on in the middle of the crisis. I wouldn't want you to think that that was all we did in the crisis. None of that stuff went off the table. We just kept doing it. But what it did do uh, is that it did uh, influence the, uh, uh, the way in which Kevin's behaviours, which subsequently um, had alienated a lot of people, weren't as obvious then as they became later. And, um, you know, I, I've got... I pay a lot of credit to Kevin uh, for what he did during the global crisis and I've known him longer and have had more personal experience with him than anyone else in the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party and I didn't enjoy uh, writing these parts of the book but I felt if we we're going to talk about uh, the outcomes and get all the pluses on the table I had to be as frank as I possibly could about the, the minuses if you like and during this period where more a more normal approach to life came along, we had to go into then the implementation phase of policy for health, the implementation uh, phase and getting through the parliament, uh, the carbon pollution reduction scheme, uh, dealing with the implications of the um, report from Henry on taxation. This, uh, if you like, uh, exposed some of the the issues which many in the cabinet and the parliamentary party uh, you know took offense to in terms of kevin's relationships with them uh, and as i say in the book uh, that there was um, it wasn't one thing that produced if you like the change of leadership it was an amalgamation of all these things a crowded policy agenda and a, and a prime minister was having difficulty in relating with many of his colleagues Although I take it from the, the book that you were against the leadership change until the actual day of the mm. change. And I did my best to try and stop mm. it, but it came, as I say, like a, you know, like a bushfire, that when someone actually uh, lit it, it just took off and raced through the show, and I try to explain why that was the case. Um, I uh, also recount a conversation I'd had with him because... It wasn't that he was, he was completely unaware that there was a fair bit of dissatisfaction with him and I recount a conversation on the plane one morning after the budget in um, 2010 where he was pretty acutely aware of it. But I didn't think it was uh, the way to go at that stage but I absolutely understood why people had the views that they did and my view was, well, if they were going to move then it had to be quite decisive, which in fact it was. If there was actually any mistake, it was that there wasn't a ballot and that after the ballot, uh, Julia and perhaps myself didn't stand up and go through in great detail why it had actually happened the way it did. That wasn't done, and I think Julia in particular carried the consequences of that, as did the, the party as a whole. Did Kevin really commission a poll on what his one core value should be? Well, that's, uh, that's what they, the pollsters tell me. Do you know what that value was? No. <laughs> You um, had a sense of foreboding about what happened, about the replacement yeah. at the time. You described not sleeping the night before. Mm. Um, I worked with Kevin Rudd a little bit uh, when I once worked for a magazine that he wrote a few articles for. And while I absolutely accept that w as an editor, working with him as a writer, it is a different kind of relationship he um i mean he came across to me as as peculiar you know he was peculiar uh, but he was consistent uh, i worked with him three times as a as a shadow foreign affairs as a labor leader and then as prime minister and the the consistency of his peculiarness was impressive well, it's it's, prob it's probably unfair to him to, uh, to, to uh, leave that sit there like that. Oh, no, I actually liked him. Yeah. I mean, I, I did like him. The, uh, yep. Kevin was only leader of the Labor Party for a short period of time. Uh, and as a consequence of that, he had the party's full support uh, and he, he ran it in his own individual way, but there was an enormous tolerance for that. 
And of course, on top of that, having slain John Howard, I think he was also given an enormous amount of credit, as he should, because he, it, it was a terrific campaign he read in 2007. But the flip side of that is that not many of the people who had actually voted him into office when they knocked off Beasley, because I supported Beasley, not Kevin, um, didn't really have a, had never really had a lot to do with him. And the truth is that those that had had the longest experience with Kevin were generally those that opposed him more fiercely, like myself. Um, so I think really what happened in uh, the period uh, at the end of 2009 is that more and more people had come to have an experience, if you like, and it hadn't been a very good one. And when it's not a very good experience with a limited number of people who meet regularly every Tuesday, um, then it can actually catch up with you pretty quickly. And sadly, I think that, if I think back on it, that's sort of the way it happened. One of the things that worries me about the, um, the great interest and it's understandable interest in the, in the leadership saga is, that, is the risk for the ALP that it will obscure what are actually more significant and, and long-term problems that it has. Um, I mean, a really obvious one being this tension between the Greens, uh, what to do with that left side of the, the, the ALP um, and the traditional base, which I think is a huge problem for the yeah. ALP. And it's one that it doesn't seem to have spent a lot of time thinking about before Kevin Rudd beat John Howard. So I wonder, well, is this occupying Labor now well in I, opposition? I think part of the problem with your question is your question is a tactical one. And I think one of the problems of those years was that people were too frequently looking for tactical solutions. Uh, and I, I would and say it's structural more no, than no, no, but, tactical. No, no, but, you know... Uh, I, I think that the ALP is best not to be looking over its shoulder either to its right or to its left uh, and that it ought to be forming its policies grounded very much in its own, in, in its values. Um, and I think there was too, there's too much uh, of some of the behaviours that occurred during this period which were more poll driven than they were s substance driven. The thing that I'm most proud of uh, by our minority government led by Julia was the way in which we anchored our policies, uh, and you could never accuse them of being anchored in polling. We anchored our substantial responses on carbon pricing, uh, on Gonski in particular, on national disability in our values, and that's when the ALP is strongest. Uh, what occurred then uh, was a whole lot of disunity that, um, you know, if you like, washed over it. The big lesson for me is stay unified and stay true to your values. Uh, and don't get too um, deflected by, you know, what the Greens may or may not be doing opportunistically or, or otherwise on our left or the government on our right. I think what people are really looking for is conviction. And I think what Kevin lost uh, towards the end of his first stint as Prime Minister and comprehensively lost in the campaign in his reincarnation was the notion that he didn't have any convictions. And, uh, and uh, what people are looking for in politics these days is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a lot of conviction. And sometimes that can put you on the wrong side of an argument, but it might serve you better in the longer term uh, rather than taking a tactical position short term to adjust your behaviour. I think there's a lot of confusion, though, among people about what those values actually are. And if, if I think about Julie Gillard's very first speech as Prime Minister, the press conference, you were standing next to her, and she said that she was going to deal with three policy areas, asylum seekers, climate change and the mining tax, sure. which were looming so hugely. Those three areas remain completely unresolved for Labor well, at I this point I in time. I don't accept uh, that at all. And in fact, let's just run through them. Uh, we got... We, we didn't get in our first term the carbon pollution reduction scheme through. From a minority position in both the House of Representatives and the Senate, we actually got the clean energy package and emissions trading system up that was virtually identical to the one that had been rejected by the Greens and the Liberals in the previous parliament. Think about that. That is an enormous achievement. Yes, it's been knocked off by uh, a new Conservative government. It'll be coming back. There's no doubt about it. It'll come back from one side of politics or the other because it is a, an economic and environmental imperative for the country. That was done. Uh, let's go to the mining tax. 
Uh, let's go to uh, the fact that they've knocked it off. This, this country is going to revisit tax reform and the number one item on the agenda is going to have to be a form of resource rent taxation and dealing with some of the very big concessions which are tilting the balance in our tax system away from ordinary people. The government's got an agenda on tax to shift the burden from corporates directly to individuals. So at a lower company rate on one hand and a higher, G higher GST on the other, that's what it is. Uh, and we were never going down that road. We were going down a labour road. Now, the fact that we lost an election and it got knocked off doesn't make it any less worthy. So there's two. Uh, deal and, and the third one is, is dealing with asylum seekers. The fact is uh, that when it comes to the humanitarian uh, approach of our party, which at its core means that if you've got a humanitarian need, you should be able to get a place in our program, you can't have it swamped by people who are coming on boats. You can't have your humanitarian program determined by everyone who jumps on a boat. So we needed to have offshore pro processing, and I don't see that changing because there is no other humanitarian response. Now, how that is done, the circumstances it is done in, are, of course, enormously important. But I see us as being very much true to our values and our convictions in all three, although I readily accept there'll be many people here and elsewhere who disagree with that. But it was policy, wasn't grounded, in, didn't come from polling. We wouldn't have been doing an emissions trading system if we'd been listening to the pollsters. We wouldn't have been doing a resource rent tax if we'd been listening to the pollsters. So, you know, I, I think we, we did all those things. Now, you know, the elephant in the room hasn't been discussed yet. Uh, the elements in our political system that are broken, and the book goes to these at great length. What the fundamental transmission system, that is the mainstream media in Australia, is not in any way uh, objective or balanced in the way in which it deals with one of our major political parties. And this is an enormous problem, an enormous problem, uh, because we're getting to a situation in this country where people with deep pockets and lots of money are throwing their weight around and seeking to produce political outcomes disproportionate to their influence, and, and they're doing that to, to tilt the balance in our political system away from average people to, 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 to selective vested interests. And of course, where that's happened in the United States, it's produced an increasing concentration of wealth at the top, and, and average people are left out of it when it comes to decent basic rates of pay and universal health and education. These things are all connected. Yes, we've suffered a defeat, but I think the policy and value platform that we've put forward is exactly the one that, 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 that is right to continue the fight in the future. If you'd like to ask Wayne Swan a question, put your hand up and if somebody puts a microphone in it, start talking. Um, thanks. Um, first off, Wayne, mm -hmm. um, thank you for the GFC response. I think we all are a better, better country for it, absolutely. Um, after the GFC, um, in America, the banks were bailed out and basically, you know, they're too big to fail. Um, there was acknowledged that there was criminal behaviour, yet I don't believe one person's even been charged yet, gone to jail for some of the things that the banks did illegally. Um, you, so, you know, you mentioned the, some of the measures you put in place to protect our banks, our big four especially, yet they chose to decouple their interest rates from the, the Reserve Bank and now basically they do what they like. Um, what do we do about these large organisations which seem to be so crucial, uh, crucial to our economy yet don't seem to want to play the game? Sure. Well, I spend a lot of time in the book talking about my uh, run-ins, if you like, uh, with, with bankers, uh, with, uh, with miners, uh, and also big polluters uh, who, um, you know, weren't shy, particularly for that second, third year period, throwing their weight around. Because essentially, they had decided that uh, they could try and take the government out. So Abbott had um, campaigned extensively after the minority government was formed, running around the place saying, this government's going to fall, this government's going to fall, which emboldened a lot of people with pretty deep pockets to take us on. So a lot, of the, a lot of corporate money went into trying to knock over the um, clean energy package. A lot of, a lot of cor corporate activity also went into trying to knock over the mining tax and, and, and to change it. Uh, and of course, the big banks who didn't like a lot of things I did, I got a reasonable, reasonable number of good reforms through, like knocking off mortgage exit fees, for example, um, bank switching, um, uh, the capacity of credit unions to become banks, 
all of those issues got got progressed, but generally we were facing some pretty uh, pretty big uh, uh, headwinds, and that's before you get to the media, uh, because you know the media uh, uh, doesn't really have any any way of demonstrating that its uh, coverage is balanced, as uh, all of their objectives uh, proclaim uh, in their newspapers. And I, uh, we've got a serious problem with a combination of people with deep pockets working closely with media proprietors to produce political outcomes uh, which are um, uh, a, a big challenge, in my view, to what I think Australia ought to be, a country which has got a decent system of industrial relations with collective bargaining and a decent minimum wage, quality universal health and education, uh, and, of course, a set of policies which deal with pollution. The more people uh, with uh, immense resources get disproportionate say, the more those sort of policies get knocked off, uh, and uh, that's, that's where we are now. All this talk about a budget emergency at the moment is nothing more than a, um, an attempt to camouflage uh, the implementation of that sort of agenda behind the notion that there's a crisis that ought to be solved. And fortunately, the Australian public has seen through that, even though it's achieved the support of most of the mainstream media, and that gives me great faith in the common sense of the average Australian voter. Hi, my name's Sarah. Thank you very much for your talk today. Um, I'm 28 and I'm recently in my first full-time job after university studies, five years. And the proposed uh, budget cuts to, say, the deregulation of university fees and the changes for social welfare and things, how do you feel that this will change, will, will alter my generation's future in relation, say, to past generations? Sure. Well, I think um, the changes uh, to the welfare system uh, and the changes to the cost of university degrees are just the Americanisation of what we'd call the Australian social safety net fully fledged, uh, they're obnoxious, but they should also be seen in concert with the changes to, to health as well. Because I think the real foundation of what's so good about our country and goes to the core of our economic prosperity and our social equity is a combination that people feel that if they get crook, they can get some decent health care. That if their kids go to a public school, there's a reasonable chance there'll be good quality. Um, and that if they have a job, they're not working for starvation wages. Um, this budget is harshest, not on the, on, on, the, on, on the pensioners, although what they're proposing with indexation is shocking, because essentially that decision we took to increase the base rate of pension uh, reduced poverty in Australia by one-fifth when we introduced that. So they're going to, going to gradually take that down by a change to indexation. But the real crime to the budget is that it's a form of intergenerational warfare against young Australians. Because when they get to you know, your age or a bit older and they're thinking about having a family or whatever, uh, and they're thinking about the education of their kids, they're not going to be able to do it in the way in which I've been able to do it or most of the people in this room have been able to do it with a reasonable health system, a reasonable education system and a reasonable... Um, industrial relations system. All those underpinnings are really, are really threatened and, and it's basically the people your age and under have never really had the experience of getting on their feet through this system who are going to really feel its absence. And it's really, in my view, a fundamental remaking uh, of our country to take us down an American road. The great irony of all of this is our government here says they want an American-style outcome. Abbott has actually said that precisely at the same time in the United States, they're trying to get Australian-style outcomes. They're trying to get, you know, a decent healthcare system that sort of might get to half of what we've got. Uh, they're trying to get a decent minimum wage. I was at a, um, a banker's conference in Washington at the end of last year, and, and the topic that was on discussion for one session was, why isn't there sufficient demand for finance? And one, uh, one guy there, the same guy that was in the room in New York that I was talking about before, jumped up and said, look, it's not rocket science. If millions and millions of workers are getting paid the minimum wage, who can afford to get a loan? We're not getting the consumption that used to come from a, a middle class that was prosperous driving the American economy anymore, and that's why there's no 
That's why there's no great oomph. That's why people are talking about, in the global economy, secular stagnation. Increasingly, the debate elsewhere in the world is about how big concentrations of wealth and income at the top of society are a handbrake on growth. So when I was speaking about my book at the press club, I finished with this story because a few weeks ago, or a month ago now, I was in New York uh, talking about these issues with, with some people and I went for a walk down a place called the High Line. It's an old railway line which runs down to the financial district and it's become an urban park. It's fantastic. And just as I got towards the end of it, I saw this big shed with this big, big writing right across the top and it just said these words very starkly. The American, sorry, the French aristocracy didn't see it coming either. <laughs> <laughs> now, elsewhere in the world, you know, the chairman of the IMF, uh, the governor of the Bank of England are going to conferences talking about what are we going to do to make capitalism more inclusive? Because it's becoming an economic imperative. These unfair outcomes are a problem. We haven't had them, yet we've got a government that wants to bring them here because somehow they're good. I'm a bit surprised Bill Shorten hasn't made more of the Americanisation line, which also just makes me think he's he's doesn't get much of a show in this book, Wayne. How do, how do you get along with Bill? <laughs> I get along with he's Bill. Hardly quite. There. He's well, hardly there. Uh, he's hardly. If you go through it, you'll find. Oh, that, I've been uh, through every word. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'll, you'll find that um, it doesn't actually single out very many people in the current caucus at all. Ooh, I wish I had time to take that on, but um, down the back there. But you should have been at my press club speech because he had a very big starring role at it. Clearly I should have. Uh, this is actually a follow-on question about your views from the backbench. And uh, going from such a key player within the government to... Sorry. Going from such a key player in the right. government to <laughs> actually... Sitting on the backbench and observing the effectiveness of the current Labor opposition leadership. So I'm wondering about your thoughts on that, as well as how you would have prosecuted or how you would have prosecuted the current budget from the Abbott government, because it seems like the reason why it's in the media and being torn down is due to a lot of gaffes and own goals rather than an effective attack or assault on that from the Labor Party. No, I don't agree with that at all. I think that the, uh, one of the reasons that the gaffes and own goals are up there is because of the opposition being so effective. I mean, I've, I, I've sat through, uh, since my time in Parliament, quite a few opposition leaders' budget replies and indeed contributed to almost every one of them since 1993, well, 1996, um, after we lost. And I think this year, Bill Shorten's reply was the best... I have ever seen and it had the biggest community impact of any opposition leaders reply since 1996 and that says something because normally they're just completely lost you get up the next day you won't you would be lucky to ever find it on page one or two and one of the reasons the government's been in so much trouble is that the opposition has done what I was calling or talking about before and, and I call for in the book stay grounded in your values don't get pushed around by tactical considerations. And that's what they've been doing. But in the current media environment, where large slabs of the mainstream media are just liberal pamphlets and barrackers for the Liberal Party, it's pretty hard to get your, your message out substantially uh, and clearly. But in those constraints, I, I think uh, Bill and the team, Tanya, uh, have done a fantastic job. Um, uh, and I don't deal with this year's budget actually in the book, so um, it actually stops. Uh, the book actually stops uh, really the night I resigned, and I just do a, a small bit at the end about the election campaign. So it doesn't actually take in any of the period of the current opposition. Hi, um, hello, and thank you very much for your for your presentation. Um, I've got two quick questions. The first is. Um, uh, how, yeah, given what you've just been saying about the current about the current budget, um, if Labor wins the next election, would they be able to overturn some of the measures? And, and just quickly, um, your the 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 measures that you talked about post uh, the GFC seem to have been innovative and world standards. 
and I, I think as a result you were, you were regarded as the world's greatest treasurer. Why is it that those kind of things weren't um, uh, 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 prime, prime during the election campaign and the fact that we got over it so well wasn't a key, a key message that we heard? Sure. Well, they were, they were prime in the 2010 campaign, which is the reason we ended up in minority government. The only reason that we were in the hunt to win in 2010, given all the leaking that occurred during the campaign, was our economic record. Uh, and, and it should have been front and centre in the last campaign, but uh, the Prime Minister at the time chose not to make it front and centre. And I, I do make the remark, uh, when I just deal briefly um, with uh, that campaign and my afterward, that, um, that uh, I was really surprised that uh, we didn't actually go really heavily on those areas that we had marked out, namely education, NDIS, the rest of it. We absolutely should have, and that didn't happen. Uh, and that's that's sort of regrettable, but I think we, we we did get the public recognition. But we've also had this constant campaign. The whole the whole exaggeration of deficit and debt from the coalition is about demonising what the Labor government did during the global financial crisis to set the scene for their remaking of Australia along the lines that I was just talking about before. That's what it's all about. You know, and we got we've got the IMF, we've got the OECD, we've got the World Bank. We've got most market economists, you know, all saying, you know, it was basically right. Some people say there was too much spent, not that, you know. But basically the core view is that it was all fine. You've got the Prime Minister of Australia still running around saying that it was a disaster and it didn't work. Now, and, and, and receiving substantial support from so-called responsible newspapers that are supposed to be balanced in their coverage. I mean... You know, you can pick up one newspaper every day, it'll be kicking uh, me to death, as it does every day, about these issues. The, it, and, and the analysis bears no relationship to the facts, because in the post-fact world they live in, uh, they are absolutely determined to take out uh, one half of our political democracy and will go to any lengths to do it. And that's what's going on at the moment. Unfortunately, it's meeting a fair bit of public resistance. Oh, there's so much I still want to talk to you about, but our time is up. It's tragic, Wayne. It was terrific to have you here on the Fifth Estate, uh, Wayne Swan. Please thank him. Thank you.